All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my second space of the day. I guess I just couldn't help myself. A lot going on. Good. We have about half a dozen or so in there. I bet some others will join soon. So for about three months, there was a meme in the conservative movement. You heard it from Tucker, you heard it from Matt Gates. you heard it from all sorts of people, that how can you call the January 6th revolt an insurrection when no one has been charged with sedition? Well, that meme really broke down last week, I think it was on Friday, when Stuart Rhodes, who is, uh, I would say, a rather fascinating guy. Uh, he actually has a Yale law degree. and He's also the leader of the Oath Keepers, and he's a kind of radical anti-government activist. He was charged with seditious conspiracy. The Proud Boys were the bodyguards for people like uh, Roger Stone and similar types, uh, and they were also the muscle of the J6 uh, coup, if you want to call it that. I we, we can talk more about what we should even call this thing. It was so buffoonish, but it was an insurrection at the end of the day. Uh, well, he was charged with sedition. Now, that charge is not used very often. First off, it is exceedingly grave to accuse someone of sedition. It's not like accusing them of failure to pay parking tickets or cheating on taxes. It's a, it's a real thing. Um, this is, I'm just going to go straight to the law itself. This is U.S. Code Title 18. If two or more persons in any state or territory or in any place subject to the jurisdiction of the United States conspire to overthrow, put down, or to destroy by force the government of the United States, that is, that sounds like extreme terrorism, um, uh, or to levy war against them, or to oppose by force the authority thereof, or by force to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States, or by force to seize, take, or possession any property of the United States contrary to the authority thereof, they shall each be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. So it's a 20-year sentence. It's not quite treason in the sense uh, <laughs> that it's a... Uh, a death penalty like charge, but it is very serious. And it, it, you know, I don't know if these guys will serve 20 years if convicted, but it, you know, it's going to be substantial. It's not just going to be three months or something like that, that you might get for a minor crime. It's, it's going to be serious stuff. Um, as you might've heard, I just saw this uh, about an hour ago, but Nicholas Fuentes and Patrick Casey have been subpoenaed by the J6 committee in Congress. Now, it should be said, this is not criminal. No one's going to go to jail due to the congressional committee. Uh, and that should be remembered. However, it is rather dire, I would say. Um, the wheels of justice turn very slowly. Things take a lot of time. If the FBI, I, I do think that very early on, the FBI was going to make a sedition charge. They were planning on it. Um, and they're not just going to, you know, shoot out an arrest warrant for someone the next week. Uh, you know, unless you, you, if something would have to be extremely brazen for that to happen. They have to collect evidence over a long period of time. They have to get grand jury indictments. They have to really go through the process and double and triple check their work. Because if they screw up on such a heinous charge, they're going to have egg all over their face. Um, I do think that Nicholas Fuentes, at the very least, is going to be criminally charged in some way. Uh, I do think that that is coming down the pike. Uh, I also think it's going to take a little time. We might see that in this year, uh, but it is going to happen, in my opinion. And I thought that very early on. Why did I think that? Because sometimes 
it's it's not just about the act itself, but it's about the act itself really crying out for some kind of prosecution. So if we look at, um, there is a video, I actually tweeted this out. I recently retweeted it. Um, I tweeted this out, you know, a couple weeks after it happened. And um, Nicholas Fuentes is not just saying bold and, you know, seemingly illegal things from a podium somewhere. At the end of the day, that might not be protected in Europe. That is absolutely protected uh, under the First Amendment. And the Brandenburg decision, Brandenburg was a kind of Ku Klux Klan Nazi type. Under that decision, you actually can say really bold stuff and it is still protected under the First Amendment. You can say things like, you know, we're going to go to Congress one day and crack a bunch of skulls. Or, you know, we're going to, we should throw out every uh, black person in the country tomorrow morning. You can say things like that, that, you know, are, are not going to happen and are, you know, extremely bold language. Um, but it's it's protected because it's kind of vague. It's It's a kind of, you know, exclamation mark, and it's going to happen someday. It's not an immediate directive to do that. Um, You know, this, I guess we're kind of getting to that. You don't have the right to yell fire in a crowded theater, kind of famous and somewhat misunderstood line from Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, Nicholas Fuentes is on videotape with a megaphone saying that, yes, we, we've stopped the vote. We're in the Capitol. We aren't leaving here until Donald Trump is installed as president. The fact is, those words can easily be construed as calling for um, the, uh, um, just to use the words itself, prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States. That can just easily, he is, in effect, urging them on. Now, Could his lawyers argue that um, people who are actually doing these things weren't in earshot of that megaphone, that he was kind of playing to the crowd? Yeah, they could definitely argue that. Maybe there's some truth there. Um, But what a lot of this indicates, getting subpoenaed by the Congressional J6 Committee, is that there is more to it. We should remember that Stuart Rhodes and the Oath Keepers, they were using Signal, which is famously an end-to-end decryption app, um, those signal messages have been recovered in some way. Uh, Probably it was recovered just because they asked for someone's phone and the Oath Keepers and they got the messages. Those messages have been recovered. And what I think this indicates is that there is some kind of planning or conspiracy behind or before J6 that Fuentes was also involved in. So it, you know, that act using the megaphone, you know, urging on people to enter Congress, telling them we're not leaving here until Donald Trump's president, that act is kind of bad enough. It does seem to fit the letter of the law. Now, whether he would be, uh, you know, actually convicted of, uh, of seditious sedition is, is another question, but it, it, it does seem at least, you know, kind of reasonable to charge him under that. But what this suggests is that there's more going on. And this is where I find the whole story um, really interesting. Because I tweeted this out in in around 2018. And this was during the um, Democratic sweep in the midterms. Uh, This is when I was criticizing Trump pretty seriously. This was also came at a time when the movement, um, you know, was criticizing me extremely harshly. You know, oh, he's bad optics. He's terrible. We hate him. We need good conservatives leading. No more Spencerism, uh, et cetera. The movement was kind of, you know, kicking me out, as it were. Uh, The former alt-right founders often said is being, you know, expelled from the alt-right. Um, I also tweeted out that time because I, I really strongly sensed this. The alt-right was integral in 
Donald Trump's victory in 2016. In fact, I think it was decisive and I think it might very well have been indispensable. Um, what do I mean by that? Do I mean that the alt-right was this huge voting block? No, I don't quite mean, mean that, although that probably shouldn't be dismissed, but I don't mean that. Um, I mean that information warfare, if that's the right term, is extremely important and is actually decisive in conservative victories. Now, Joe Biden won without that because the 2020 election was all about Trump. So it was almost like that. It was all that craziness almost was working in reverse, so to speak. So those people who were posting QAnon memes, they weren't just inspiring their own troops. They were also kind of inspiring the liberals who were getting freaked out by it. Um, that being, you know, Joe Biden is kind of an aberration in the sense that he won running the most traditional of traditional campaigns. He won without having media influencers in his pocket. That being said, I don't think Trump could have won that way. And that's one of the reasons, not the only one, that Trump, given many opportunities, never really denounced the alt-right. He denounced, you know, neo-Nazis or whatever in a kind of very vague way. But when given the opportunity, he never denounced the alt-right, much like in 2020, he never really denounced the Proud Boys. He was given an opportunity, infamously in debate, debate, and he said, uh, stand by and stand back and stand by, which everyone assumed is like, you're, you're just telling them to wait to keep their powder dry, <laughs> which he kind of was. Um, he needed that decisive, outrageous, um, working for free online energy that the alt-right brought him in 2016. And that was, that morphed into and was also kind of replaced by even bigger and even crazier online movements like QAnon, like what MAGA had, you know, descended into certainly by, by 2019 and 2020. And Nicholas Fuentes was a part of that. So in 2018, I, tw I tweeted out, I think I foresee a construction of a kind of neo-alt-right that is going to be very important in Donald Trump's campaign in 2020, in the sense that it's going to pick up on a lot of the energy, the frog energy of 2016, the chaos, the craziness, the silliness, uh, et cetera. Um, but it's going to not be led by someone like me who has his own agenda. I have my own agenda. I thought, you know, in 2016, I was obviously taken in by Trump, but I'm not here to be anyone's cheerleader. If Trumpism can support what I care about and my ideas, then in, my, in the promotion of myself, to be brutally frank, then I will support it. If it's just a toxic, you know, nonsense movement, then I'm not going to support it. I'm going to criticize it. I'm going to call it out. Well, Nicholas Fuentes was the type of person who could command an organic online movement. He was, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of his support is fake. I think he has really genuine support coming from his live streams. And you can see that in the super chats. You can see that in the you know, uh, fervency that people support him. Uh, so he had a real organic base of people, young people, non-voters <laughs> to a large degree, but people who identified with him, saw him as, as a kind of reflection of themselves, were caught up in the energy, felt like they were winning. And then once the 2020 election went south, in their view, were mad as hell and, weren't going to take it anymore. Nicholas Fuentes was there very early on in the Stop to Steal movement. So early on, it wasn't Donald Trump, uh, you know, out front in this. It wasn't even Lynn Wood early on um, or Sidney Powell. Early on, it was Alex Jones, Ali Akbar, Ali Alexander, and Nicholas Fuentes riding around in Humvees, talking about the election being stolen, ginning up interest, and that Groiper army that he had accumulated and that he led was the kind of vanguard of this movement. 
They were out front of it before the boomers came along. Very similar dynamic um, was at place with, with the QAnon movement. So QAnon originated on 4chan, then it went to 8chan, all that kind of stuff. It, you know, these are, this is a place of absolute craziness, um, trolling, white supremacy, uh, horrifying pornography, et cetera, for, you know, the 4chan culture and 8chan culture. Uh, by 2018, it was the Q drops were disseminated through major figures like Jerome Corsi and Alex, jo- and Alex Jones to an audience of Gen X and boomers, people who would never in a million years go on 4chan. But they were getting the drops and they were getting the interpretations. They were interpreting themselves. And it became a self-sustaining online movement. It became kind of bigger than Q itself. Or, you know, who is Q? Q is the, the whole army of people who are consuming the drops, talking about them every day, live streaming, commenting, sending in super chats, wearing a T-shirt, telling their friends, going and talking to people in Facebook groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you need a, a, a candidate like Trump needs that online energy in order to succeed. He can get that from dedicated people who are never really going to leave him. Nicholas Fuentes has criticized Trump, you know, for sometimes for good reason, you know, just to be totally fair here. At the end of the day, he's never really going to leave Trump. There's a kind of Fuentes two-step going on where Trump will, you know, fail. He'll do tax cuts. He'll fail at immigration reform. He'll fail at this. He'll fail at that. He'll say something stupid. And you can kind of lash out at him and say, ah, you know, Blonald bump or, you know, orange man bad or Yang gang 2019, et cetera. You can kind of lash out at him. But at the end of the day, you circle the wagons and you'll go to bat for him and you will stick with him till the end. There were clearly people who could not command this kind of online energy, who went, who saw in Fuentes a, you know, a, a, a kind of energy that they wanted to tap into. Um, if you look up organizations like Women for Trump or Women for America First, some of these were kind of former Tea Party organizations They are the ones that are renting out space who are seemingly, from an outside perspective, collaborating with Fuentes, knowing that they can't command a Groyper army. They can't command an army of teenagers and people in their early 20s, edgy, very online, you know, incels. They can't tap into that energy, but Nicholas Fuentes can, and they want to work with him. So... I was always curious about the um, very large Bitcoin donation, which I think was like $200,000 or something like that, which Nicholas Fuentes got in the fall or or winter of 2020. I I heard about it, as a lot of other people did. It seemingly came from this mysterious French donor. Um, I have always been rather skeptical of that. It, It just strikes me as hard to believe that a... French nationalist would donate something to called America first. I mean, that's just my impression. I might be wrong about that. Um, my sense was that it was really, this person also has committed suicide who, who did this. My vision of that is that it was a kind of payoff of some kind for services rendered by Fuentes. Fuentes did what needed to be done. There, this wasn't just trolling. This wasn't just live streaming for the lulls and to be based. This was playing an integral part in a major GOP strategy to take back the election of 2020. He was an integral, decisive, indispensable part in that. And you have to ultimately pay people when they're doing a service like that. So that's just my, that's my outside view. I don't have any direct evidence for that. Uh, I would stress that. Um, That's just simply my view. God knows that Ali Akbar, Ali Alexander, um, generated tons of funds by jumping on Stop the Steal really early and fundraising off it privately. 
Um, you know, I, 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 that is my sense that that payment was a kind of payoff. I might very well be wrong about that. And it was a genuine gift that just so happened to occur at that time. Um, I'm skeptical and it's very clear that the J six committee is skeptical. They mentioned that in their press release. Um, and they, they seem to think that money was changing hands in a, you know, quid pro quo fashion, this for that. You get your, your online army behind Stop the Steal, you get paid off. Now, I think that Fuentes, and this is owing to his youth in many ways, was taken for a ride in all of this. Um, I, I will say this, and I say this absolutely truthfully and absolutely genuinely, I feel sorry for Fuentes um, I don't like Nicholas Fuentes personally. I don't like Nicholas Fuentes ideologically uh, for the most part. But, and I, I, I think that whole kind of ironic, trollish attitude is just, it can be funny on occasion. It's ultimately toxic. But I do feel sorry for him because I don't think he was the mastermind in this. I think he was an actor in someone else's play. Or he was a pawn on the board. There were big you know, institutions in conservatism, Inc., that wanted to take advantage of the Groypers and the energy that he created in an organic fashion. They wanted to tap into that lightning, that electricity that he created. And at the end of the day, it's people like Fuentes who are going to be the fall guy when the shit hits the fan. It's Fuentes who was out there, who everyone's looking to, who's holding a megaphone, boldly declaring, this is great that you stopped the, the uh, counting of the votes. Go in there right now. Go do more of it. We're not leaving here until Donald Trump is president. Now, was this ever going to be successful? No. But is that kind of language sedition? Yes. And so you have a lot of people, longtime institutions, the boomers that, you know, Fuentes rages against, that were using him for their own ends. And then he is going to face some sort of consequences that maybe they will not, because he became the face of this thing. And in that sense, though I'm not a Fuentes fan, I do genuinely feel sorry for him. But it just, it's just a, a bigger lesson, a cautionary tale about getting involved in these toxic movements. It's, you know, and here I, I think one does have to be ideologically principled and serious about what you really want. If you're just doing things, you're trying to please your crowd, you're, you're just kind of going with the flow and you're, you know, preaching to the choir, you're, you're, you know, trying to tap into these bigger forces, you can sometimes get burned really bad. I am interested in promotion of my own ideas and principles. If someone like Trump is, you know, encouraging that, then that's great. If it's just this toxic, stupid Trump movement, then I have no interest because that type of movement is actually damaging me and damaging my ideals. And there's no question that, you know, I, I became a household name. The spotlight was on me for a time, but I too have been damaged by my association with this political fanaticism. It is what it is. Um, you know, I don't have regrets so much as I try to learn things and try to do things differently in the future. Um, I don't know if Fuentes is going to get that chance because Fuentes kept going. He put his chips on the table. He said that the election was fraudulent. We aren't leaving here until Donald Trump is president. He won by a landslide, etc. And it's at some point, like that's, that's fun to do on some live stream to your fans who are going to send you and you are going to send you super chats. You go and do that in real life. It doesn't matter how buffoonish you are 
it doesn't matter that you're waving a Kekistani flag and that you're all kind of silly kids. That is going to be treated as sedition by the state. It's very serious stuff. And I don't think Fuentes will get out of this without a conviction, to be honest. And I have thought that for about a year. And I think that that is happening right now. All righty. Um, that is, those are my thoughts just to get the conversation started. Um, we have about four people who've made requests, so I'll let you guys in. And um, you can ask me questions. So Gotika Communista Fascista, you are up first. So you have to uh, unmute your mic. Uh, uh, hi, Nick Fuente. I'm oh, sorry. Hi, Richard Spencer. I love you. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Okay. Um, Oakville Citian. Oakville, you are up. Can you hear me, Richard? Yes, I can. I distinctly recall that time... Uh, you and Nick got into a giant argument on a live stream. Uh, do you feel like you have ended up on the better side of the tracks after this uh, this amazing occurrence here? Um, well, yeah, I, I don't really want to dance on anyone's grave. Um, are you talking about a 2017? I mean... Yeah, it was a long time ago, but I always just fought, found that to be a bit funny. Yeah, well, I mean, I think for a long time, I mean, look, for a, for a long time, I was flying high as Mr. Alt-Right and, you know, notorious, whatever. Then I started feeling a lot of pressure that I really wasn't prepared to fight off, where there was, a, you know, there were a lot of media stories that were ultimately kind of glowing. You know, even if they said, oh, he's a bad character or whatever, they were ultimately kind of pumping me up. After, um, particularly after Charlottesville, I mean, that, that was a real turning point. Um, the stories were nasty. Um, the stories were trying to tear me down. Um, the deplatforming, particularly from payment processors, but also just from the web, that was a really serious issue. Um, it's much less of an issue for me now as um, I have made it very clear that I'm interested, you know, in ideological philosophical discussion. Um, I'm not doing activism. Um, and so that hasn't, you know, harmed me, but I mean, Nick was also flying high. Nick was never really in the situation that I was in, in 2016 to 2017, because it was new. Um, but Nick also had, more or a more organic fan base than I did um, because Nick represents his people. He kind of plays to his crowd. He preaches to the choir in a way that I never did and never would and never could. And so he was kind of flying high in the movement. I mean, I think he was clearly the most, you know, popular alt-right or dissident right figure for some time and but you know again you if you're just doing live streams that's one thing but he went out there in what is the most just toxic mendacious movement that i have ever seen in my life and that is the stop the steal QAnon, trump 2020 nonsense and he put his chips down. And I think he almost had to, in a way. Um, and he's going to get burned by it. So, yeah, there is a certain irony to that. I don't want to uh, stress it <laughs> too much. There's also an irony in the fact that so much of Nick's rise came after Charlottesville with the kind of optics war. The optics war that was played by you know, some people's not not necessarily Nick, but some people with some of the worst possible optics like Weave and Andrew Anglin and so on, that was basically tearing down, tearing apart the movement, tearing certainly tearing down me, and basically saying that this is how pragmatic we are. Like you guys are a bunch of thugs and losers. 
we are the real pragmatists who are going to take power by trusting in Trump and looking like conservatives and talking like conservatives and waving flags, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that ended up in J6. That's where that path went. So there is like a tremendous amount of irony in all this. Even pa I noticed that Patrick Casey as well was subpoenaed. So he's been dragged into this and he was the ultimate just nasty optics war kid. And he even threw Nick under the bus <laughs> after J6. So it was, um, yeah, he is always playing that game. I don't know what has happened to Patrick or where he is at the, this point, but um, again, he is going to face something. I didn't know he was involved with J6 at all. I didn't see, I didn't see any pictures of him there, but apparently he was there. Um, he's pretty easy to miss and forget. Uh, forget because he's just such a dork but um you know apparently he was there according to this memo uh so yeah it has ended up very bad for them and you know again i don't there's no love lost i don't feel like i have anything at stake with them i don't feel like i'm part of the same movement as them i do think that they also represent the the alt-right or the, the dissident right better than i did um, but, you know, it, it is what it is. That's that's where these things end up. OK, um, Horatius, you can jump in. All right. Can you hear me? Um, one of the things I think about J6 and the lead up to it is that it reminds me of viewership between. What is it Newsmax? Was that what it was or what's that? It was it. It challenged Fox ever oh, so briefly. Own, what was it? Own? Was it own? One American okay. News Network. Yes, they briefly in November and December. You can find reports of this. Um, the executives at Fox could really care less that, like the quote unquote, like liberal media or whatever that term, that they are criticized by them. However, they felt extremely threatened by own. One American yeah. News Network, because it was taking away views and therefore also money. Yes. And so you could really see this, and that really dragged like Fox News, even like Tucker Carlson, among others, it really dragged Fox News into having to basically support uh, Trump in the narrative of the stolen election. And so yes. I think that in the case of Nick, is that either he would do it or someone else did because there let's be serious there are there were thousands of just countless numbers of grifters on youtube having podcasts twitter users who were willing to make a lot of money off of this and so a lot of people like nick um, and fox with dealing with own and so on and they're not all in the same boat in the sense of like ideologically or institutionally but they, they are all in the same boat in the sense that they got dragged into doing it yeah and eventually they eventually you know when you talk the talk, eventually you walk the walk and you start to really believe it. Or you again, you walk the walk so much that you get so caught up in it that you walk so far down the road that you, you can't really make a big U-turn. Yeah. And so I see it that, um, that by following Trump, by following Trump, they themselves got burned as a result. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think everything that you're saying is, is definitely true. I mean, you could even, you know, you, you can see some twists and turns with Fox's relationship to Trump because Fox was not pro Trump at the beginning. And we can remember that Megyn Kelly, who was, you know, maybe second to Bill O'Reilly in terms of being a superstar, you know, at the network, she was attacking Trump and she was kind of trying to issue some knockout blows. Now, Trump, you know, fought back and issued some blows of his own and kind of changed her career. And I don't think it's really recovered. Um, but Fox was not necessarily pro-Trump, but they followed their own audience. I think during 2020, uh, people like Brett Baer and those types of people, Chris Wallace, they were kind of sighing in relief that Trump is over. And it's like, Fox is calling Arizona, you know, it's over. And we can now move on, we can move back to our really you know, tried and true grift, which is to yell about the Democrats spending too much money and 
you know, being sympathetic towards Islam or whatever and blah, blah, blah. We can kind of go back to our original grift and this and Trump who kind of usurped all of us is going to be is going to go away. Even Tucker in, in like November and December of 2020 was, you know, going against Sidney Powell. He was kind of, you know, mm-hmm. hedging his bets, you could say. Um, and but they all have to go with this base and Trump knows how to speak to that base and rile them up. They kind of can't get away from them. And so Fox, I think, was kind of ready to go back to business as, as usual, but they just simply could not do that. And and so that's why, like, Tucker has gotten more race baity, you know, talking about the great replacement and all that kind of stuff. Tucker has, there's also, you, you can see this, um, you know, this is an, almost another subject, but the, the creation of a kind of neo-alt-right, you see Tucker promoting, you know, Mencius Molbug or all these kind of various people like this. Surprised he didn't promote Jack Murphy, or maybe he did. Um, and they, they kind of promote this, you know, uh, you know, alt-light, you know, with a all rights reserve sign on it, you know, alt-right, alt-light ink that they want to promote because they need to go get that audience. And they're kind of dragged back into it. Nick, whatever you want to say for him, he did jump on that bandwagon. I mean, he saw a moment uh, for action and he took it, you know, and I, again, I totally disagree with him. I think that whole thing was massively toxic. I don't like him personally. I don't like him ideologically. That being said, there was some bravery in that. You know, he put himself out there. He went into the forum and lost that- this sort of reminds me of the um, one thing that people don't really understand is that when it comes to the press in America, the idea that you have like professional journalists, as we think of them now, mm-hmm. is very much a mid to late 20th and now early 21st century phenomenon. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the reality is that newspapers were extremely hard scrabble and were extremely partisan. Yes. Um, you know, it used to be the case that literally every town in the country had a Democratic newspaper and a Republican newspaper where the name Democrat or Republican would literally be in the title. Yeah. And so I think that with the advent of the Internet, I mean, first you had tele- you had radio and television that was very like oligarchic because you don't have a handful of channels and you can really regulate it. In the case of the Internet, you have to a certain degree, at least for a while, uh, democratize the means of communication. Um, That's kind of increasingly becoming less the case. But I think that what we saw in the latter half of the 2010s was basically almost a return to like 18th, 19th, and early 20th century press. Just extremely partisan and just a lot of guilt. Yeah, you're absolutely true. There, there were also, I mean, in New York City, there would be like a dozen newspapers and things like that. And not yeah, just I mean, kind the, of two where the New York Times is kind of highbrow and liberal and New York right. Post is lowbrow and more or less Republican. You, you would have like just countless news, but, you know, neighborhood things and, um, you know, highly partisan things of all, all sorts. Um, French Revolution, you saw that. I mean, even, even the origin of the word libel is uh, that it's a little book. It's all these little pamphlets that are being created. And it's, um, you know, very similar to what we saw happening with, you know, the internet where you'd kind of grab, you, you, you'd grab on to like your grifter of choice, someone who really expressed your view or you resonated with or personally or something like that. And he was your news source. I mean, this is something I've, I've also talked about before where um, there's this interesting change that occurred with Trump. And I don't think Trump like caused it, but, but he was definitely decisive in this change. So that, you know, Trump was kind of like Ron Paul. He was like the, the candidate from the internet. Maybe even Ron Paul is more important in this if we, if we remember, because remember, there would be these Republican debates in like um, 2007 and 2008. And Ron Paul would always win the, um, the polls by a landslide. So there'd be a Fox news debate with Ron Paul and, you know, Sean Hannity's there just waiting to, 
you know, um, give the debate to, you know, whatever designated Republican there was. And it would be like, oh, Ron Paul wins by 75 percent because it was an Internet thing. And he had this great, you know, crazed fanatic support. Donald Trump was very similar to that in the sense that he would he 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 went directly to his supporters through Facebook and Twitter. And so they weren't getting their news from the you know Des Moines Register or the New York Times. They were getting their news from Trump. And so previously, like the Des Moines Register would, you know, endorse someone and kind of inaugurate them as the candidate. But now you were getting your news from Trump. So it didn't matter what those people said, because if they if they were if they bashed Trump or, or endorsed someone else, Trump would be just like, oh, uh, you know, the swamp does it again. You know, the establishment have chosen their show of the week, you know. And so he would he would kind of do an end run around mainstream media and just tr- talk directly to his fans. And you can kind of see that as well with someone like Tim Poole, where, you know, Tim Pool, his entire show, uh, to the extent that I have seen it and know what's going on, is about reacting to other news articles. But the fact is, you you get his take before you get the thing itself. So you're not actually reading a New York Times article or seeing something on the nightly news. You're getting Tim Pool's hot take on this thing, and you're actually never seeing the thing itself. So it, it's kind of like a, 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 what's the right word? It's it's like a sim, simulacrum or, or it's like, what's a better way of saying it? You're, you're getting the, you're seeing the reflection and you're not seeing the thing. Isn't, it's isn't that all mediated? Go ahead. Isn't that just, didn't you just describe like Rush Limbaugh's career? Yeah. Like taking, taking news. I mean, he was obviously much more professional. He, he would say stupid stuff every once in a while. But, you know, he because of the fact that he was on the radio and because that's much more regulated, he had to pull back a lot. Yeah. Yet, I mean, that's basically <clears throat> Rush Limbaugh's career. Yeah. And, you know, I say that, you know, I say that as somebody from middle America who, like, could remember, like, painting fences in high school, doing, like, summer jobs as he plays in the background. But that's basically <laughs> his career. He I think he once openly stated, like, early in his career and during his shows, he told people don't bother reading the press or watching the news. I'll, I'll, I'll watch the news and read the stories and then I'll tell you what to think about it. Like he like, yeah. literally said that at one point. And yeah. so that's when you look at Fuentes and, and this, let's not focus on him too, particularly with this phenomenon. When you look at Fuentes in the entire, um, quote unquote, dissident, right? The, the grift, right? Um, it's basically that, but much more democratized. And I, that's a kind of a sad yes. thing because we like to think that people are more civilized, but no, when you democratize it, it, I mean, there's that saying, I think it was an Austrian uh, prince or something who said the problem with democracy is that you expect extraordinary things out of ordinary people. And <laughs> I mean, I think the extraordinary thing is that they're doing a lot of extraordinarily dumb things. And yeah, that's really sad. And a lot of it has to do with leadership, but still, I mean, their energy can only be channeled cannot be used to govern yeah and i i think it's it's a really big thing and uh, i don't know if you've um ever encountered uh jockey lule um but he has a um a book called propaganda and um he and he has another book called the technological society and what what he's basically saying is that you know there was a social order in the middle ages and early modern period we were a you know profoundly agricultural society we were a much more churched society the church was kind of the center of um you know propaganda in his sense of the word and telling people what's right and wrong what's up and down and as we moved into modernity and urbanization and so on we needed to go back in some way to some kind of institution that could tell you what's up and down or what's right and wrong and, and kind of limit debate. And that was things like the nightly news or the New York times. Well, and, this is, um, and now those things are, have law. I mean, those things still exist. The nightly news. I don't even know if it still exists, but the New York times still exists and they still are powerful. 
but they are losing legitimacy. They're suffering a huge legitimacy crisis. And so a lot of people, I've, I've heard this a lot with the dissident right where, um, you know, I remember someone showing me this of like Jared Taylor said this, you know, like, you know, white people no longer believe the mainstream media or whatever. And the, the implication is that they're going to be looking to you. They're going to just start agreeing with you. No, they're not. They are going to start agreeing with Tim Pool. They are going to start agreeing with their, you know, Griff du jour, or they're going to start agreeing with QAnon. And it, it's just like these, these older institutions, you know, we might not like them and we might say rightly like they're liberal or whatever, but they did serve a purpose and they did kind of structure society. And what comes after those institutions after this legitimacy crisis, you know, remains to be seen. Like it, it actually is pretty scary and there is a lot of potential for disinformation. I mean, I, again, we're so inured to like, you know, sneering at these terms like this, like, you know, fake news was originally a reference to actually fake news, you know, like things like the Pope endorses Trump or Hillary Clinton is part of a pedophile ring or whatever. Um, like actual fake stories. But it, Trump kind of flipped it on its head. And so he's like, oh, no, it's the fake news media, CNN, whatever. Um, and very similar to disinformation, where if you, if you say that word, people are like, oh, disinformation, that's just your you know, slang for censorship, basically. You, you want to cut out conservative voices. Well, disinformation is real. Like all of those stories that we're getting – tremendous traction on facebook about like pizzagate and the pope and all this craziness Th those were fake and those did actually have a huge impact in the election um you know covid all of this just nonsense and people making fun m making money off nonsense presenting themselves don't get vac vaccinated don't take a free medication um, instead, talk to me and I'll be your medical guru for therapies of all kinds. And you're going to spend thousands of dollars ultimately. I mean, their they're, disinformation is a real thing. And I don't know if a, you know, population can be governed that is like this. I think that I don't really think that the New York Times is losing a legitimacy. We're going to pull into elite theory here. But in the, in the Aristotelian sense... I mean, yeah, it's technically not legitimate in the eyes of many people, but in the platonic sense, um, the New York Times is perfectly legitimate. Uh, you have what? Gold souls, silver souls, gold souls, silver souls, and bronze souls. Um, you know, the gold souls run the New York Times and other institutions too, but they run the Times, and the silver souls read the New York read. Times. <laughs> right. right. And, and so, <laughs> and, you know, the Times is, I mean, they're expecting unironically that they might have, you know, 10 million subscribers subscriptions within this decade. Yeah. And so when it comes to those who actually run the institutions, whether it be like the physical ones, like those of various uh, government agencies that have hard power or certain institutions that have soft power, like publishing houses, you know, various departments of educations um, in, in the States and national level, and also, of course, uh, media programs um, in Hollywood, whatever. The, all those writers, directors, publishers, executives, they're all reading the Times. And mm -hmm. so that whole uh, epistemological narrative isn't just going to kind of go away. It's more so the case that everybody's reacting to it negatively and not that they're really capable of challenging it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, there there is a... You know, and I think you, you made my point more nuanced with that addition. I mean, there, there, there's, all, there's always been this asymmetry between the left and the right, where it's like liberals make the news or write the news in the sense that media has a left-wing bias and conservatives react to the liberals. So it, it's, it's a very strange, you know, it's a very asymmetrical relationship where if you look at all of right-wing media, effectively all of it is reaction to liberals and they might do some original reporting but that's really that plays second fiddle to their fundamental objective which is to 
deconstruct the liberals or yell at them or do thought pieces on, you know, their principles or whatever. And it's very asymmetrical where, you know, you know, you have like the Federalist or National Review or the Daily Caller or Breitbart or whatever, and then Tim Pool and all this kind of stuff. But then the liberals have the New York Times, like they get the first word in terms of setting the narrative of what people are going to react to. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, these institutions are extremely powerful, but they also have they also have no responsibility in the sense that when they're providing a narrative that can be pretty abusive, um, there's like no, I don't want to say recourse, it's not the right term. There's no institutional pressure put on them to, um, right. to change what they're doing. I mean, like over the past like decade, the hinterlands of the country have just been raked over the coals like never before, yet for the Times and other, other elite institutions, not within the government, other the times and other elite institutions have been increasing their profit margins. Yeah. Um, and have been, I mean, the times Jesus Christ, it increased like eight, it increased by like eightfold. It was ridiculous. And so there's no institutional incentive or disincentive to get them to change what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have a lot, you also have a lot of true believers uh, mm -hmm. uh, there as well. And um, I also recall that when Senator Cotton back in 2020, Tom Cotton, wrote that article about using the military to quell violence in cities yeah. that it was actually leaked that the New York times, after that article was published, the New York times experienced the greatest number of subscription cancellations in a single hour since they've had electronic online subscriptions. Wow. Just for that, just for that one single article written by a Senator. Wow. And so there is a huge, there's no financial incentive for like them or institutional incentive for them to change what they're doing. Yeah. And that's, you know, that <sighs> these things are independent and that's good on one level, but it's bad on one level if they're, if they have a lot of power, but there's no responsibility. So, yeah. but I'm done talking. I'll let somebody else speak. No, you make some excellent points. Um, thank you. Um, Arthur Fleck, you can jump in. Yeah. I just want to say, Sorry for my voice if it sounds a little... Um, I have COVID right now, but... Okay, well, I hope you get better. Thank you. Yeah, but I was. I just want to say, I think this whole thing is... Uh, with the January 6th and how they're... I think they're just overplaying it in the committee. Uh, I think it's just kind of a... Overreaction by the media uh, to blow it up. And uh, I think it's mostly just... I think it was... Uh, a riot that just got out of hand and they want to act like it was a insurrection or trying to take over the government or something. Well, I mean, I, I, I just strongly disagree with you. I mean, I, I, I do think that it was awfully buffoonish. And so it's kind of hard to take it seriously when you see these famous images of, you know, uh, my man, the, uh, QAnon shaman or, uh, the guy stealing the podium or the old grandma, you know, walking through the Capitol. And, you know, that's fair. It's not a coup in the sense of like Mussolini's March on Rome or some kind of, you know, Juan Perón like deal, but it was absolutely an attempt to thwart the election of 2020 and it wasn't just a bunch. I mean, yeah, there were a lot of people there who might not have even thought of it as a coup, but just wanted to be like, oh, it's a Trump rally. I'm, I'm a big Trump fan, whatever. There were a lot of people who did want to go in and at least talk about hanging Mike Pence and so on. And I mean, whether they meant that or not, OK, but, you know, they, they were at least there boldly declaring that. And there was a legal maneuvering going on with like the Eastman memo that was absolutely geared towards negating the electors and keeping Trump in office on January 6th, period, end of statement. I mean, it wasn't going to succeed. It was a different type of coup than we're used to, but it was an attempt at that. And, they, and, they, and part of that was using the muscle of the Trump movement to, 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 for the Trump movement to go, you know, in Donald Trump's words, I'm going to go arm in arm with you. We're going to go down to the Capitol. 
We're going to encourage our guys, our senators. We're going to, you know, shock and awe Mike Pence into, you know, giving in. So it was an attempt to thwart the election of 2020. It just, it just was. And it's not like, I mean, it's, yeah, there is some hypocrisy. I would absolutely admit that where you can find instances of liberals like entering the Capitol or Black Lives Matter burning down a public facility or a courthouse or something, or even like the, um, uh, the, the Seattle situation where you, you kind of had like anarchy in a neighborhood for two weeks or whatever. Um, but the fact is those things can be dismissed as merely crime. They weren't ultimately a t- an attempt to reverse an election or anything like that. And so, yeah, there is some hypocrisy going on. Sure. But th- those things were qu- qualitatively different. And the fact that conservatives just can't admit this, I, I think is, is just wrong. I mean, it was what it was like. They, they actually meant what they were saying. And it was an attempt to change the election. It just was. That is sedition. You know, I, I just feel like this, this just attempt to say that, like, the liberals are out of hand. Yeah, the liberals are shrill as hell. I agree. But, like, that doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, okay. Well, don't so, you think... Yeah, go ahead. Well, don't you think if... Uh... How come there was no uh, conspiring beforehand, and why weren't they armed? There was conspiring beforehand, and many of them were armed. I mean, the Oath Keepers brought all of these guns as came out in the indictment. They brought all these guns. They kept them in Virginia. There were bombs placed in both the RNC and the DNC. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, just because you... You know, it, it doesn't look like coups of the past doesn't mean that it wasn't an attempt to thwart the election. And it was kind of weirdly half-hearted. One of the things I noticed in that indictment of Stuart Rhodes is that they, you know, they were doing all this craziness. And then afterwards, they went to the Olive Garden, which is pretty funny, you know, when you're here, your family, I guess. But, you know, it's, it's pretty funny, but it, it, and maybe on some level, they didn't take it all that seriously, but they did what they did. Right, but Nick was never in the Capitol. He was outside. Yes, and that is why he is not charged with trespass. The, the, all of those people, like 500 or even more, who have been charged with trespassing in the Capitol, have been charged, they have been charged with minor crimes. Some of them might have to serve some time, like many, many months. I think the QAnon shaman might be in there. I mean, he's already been in prison for a year. Um, maybe he'll have to spend another year there. I forgot what he got. I think he got 40 months or something like that, which is a lot of time. He probably won't spend, serve all of it, but you know, he, yeah, from what we know, Fuentes was not in the Capitol. Um, but like, again, we're moving on to a new stage of prosecution and it's now about sedition and conspiracy. So they, they knocked off all the low hanging fruit at the beginning, people who were photographed, walking into the Capitol and they're now going to a higher stage of this prosecution. Yeah. Baked Alaska was charged with trespassing. Shout out to my boy Yoba. Yeah. Okay. Um, Would you be willing to debate Nick soon? I've always said that I'm willing to talk to Nick, but I I think that Nick might have bigger fish to fry. Uh, Okay. These days, but I, I am I actually am willing to talk with him. And also, these things are recorded now. Um, I think my treatment of Nicholas Winters has been uh, fair. Um, I actually have said, and I mean this uh, genuinely. I, I actually do feel sorry for him because I think that he was he was a pawn in someone else's game. I don't think Nick was the mastermind behind all this. I, I think that he was taken in by it he profited by it and he he expanded his you know notoriety and brand there's no question but he he was kind of someone else's he was an actor in someone else's play or whatever metaphor you want to use okay uh locked down you've got the floor thank you richard thank you richard for taking my question uh i have a question for you about eric is a more all right you can't talk like that and 
demand that I take you seriously. Okay. Uh, Z Sterner, you have the floor. Hi, Richard. Um, Hi. It's a pleasure to speak with you. I, I've actually shaken your hand, but we didn't, we didn't actually really get a chance to speak. It was kind of a fleeting moment uh, there okay. at Charlottesville. But uh, oh, wow. I'm glad to finally get the chance to talk to you. And um, I'll start off right off the bat by saying that I, I have a lot of respect um, for not necessarily. I mean, it's been fascinating to watch your trajectory since all of then, you know, fascinating to put yeah. it mildly. But um, I do and I, I don't agree with all of it, um, but I do um, want to know more. And I can say that I do respect the whole ethos of um, wanting to challenge your audience. I, I think that is very respectable and is a rarity amongst um, people kind of at your level. So, yeah, I just want to give you props for that. And thank you. Um, I, my question uh, with the five percent um, and it's sort of pan Europeanism. I'm curious what that really amounts to in terms of real political or national allegiances. So you have um, a lot of these people who are calling themselves 5% um, seem to uh, support the European Union, or at least I've seen a lot of them challenge the notion of Brexit um, having been a good thing. Um, and I've kind of extrapolated that to at least be somewhat... Um, favorable to the European Union as it actually exists today, yeah. um, you know, and I, I don't take it to be really an abstract, you know, pan-European th thing. It seems to be, you know, a, a real, you know, we support Europe as it currently exists. And there's the Macron phenomena, which you, yeah. you seem to inflamed. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's... And I've always been like this. I mean, I, I did oppose Brexit in 2016. <laughs> And, I remember, you know, yeah. 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 And I, I think maybe there are reasons um, for supporting the European Union or questioning Brexit that might not necessarily have been the same. I don't remember mm -hmm. what your whole uh, rationale was for that back then. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems to me to be a sort of contradiction. It seems to me to, as a white, you know, as, you know, a white supporting person, uh, to want to work with the European Union or support it as it currently exists seems to be calling for a coalition of the Browns, so to speak. And I know it's a lot of these 5% people, you know, a lot of them, frankly, are not white. And, you know, that, that's, that's okay. You know, that's fine. But they, when it comes to questions of... <laughs> you could say Jewish the same exclusion, thing about the Groypers. You could, you could, you know, yeah, that's, I I'm, and I'm no I fan. Think a lot of um, ex excuse me a little bit, which 5%er is not white? Who are you referring to? Um, I can't remember his name. I was in a thread a night or two ago with a, a, a half Hispanic person, and then there was a, um, I believe, another Hispanic individual that was talking about, you know, reconciling white racialism with, um, I guess, whatever political admixture you could say. The you know, that, that sounds a lot. Look, I, I am not the leader of the five percenters. I, I think at one point in 2020, I put five percent on my uh, profile. It was it was kind of it was a meme about basically the white five percent of white male voters who turned against Trump in 2020. And that actually cost him the election, uh, arguably. And, um, you know, I can't speak for the five percenters. I'm not in I'm not even in a five percenter group chat or something. I they might like me. I might like a lot of them, but I don't know a lot about it. What you what you see. I mean, I have seen in terms of like the. Castillo nationalism or that kind of stuff. I, I see a lot more of that with the BAP people to go to another, you know, little online yeah, definitely. subculture. That's, that's, a, that's a fair counterpoint. But I mean, I see an account like, uh, what was it? A, a European propagandist, I think, you know, posting like a, the big fist, you know, against the bankers. And, you know, they after just Macron posting, like you have at best a Rothschild adjacent banker in Macron and you're talking about throwing out the bankers. It's it's uh, I, I see these contradictions and I, I just uh, it's hard to square. Well, I can only speak for myself. I mean, it you, you can't just ask me to explain, you know, what someone's doing on some thread. I it, I will fully admit to a lot of those criticisms about Macron. He is he was a kind of neoliberal puppet on some level. He's a liberal centrist. Macron is fascinating to me because he is an intellectual in office. He is someone who actually 
has a vision for a European order, a French inflected European order, but it's certainly a European order. And he has talked about a European army, in fact. Um, this is someone who fascinates me. So I, I have a maybe to a certain degree, my tongue is in my cheek uh, with the Macron inflation because it's kind of like, yeah, this guy is not, you know, it, you wouldn't expect it from Spencer. You, you certainly wouldn't call Macron a white nationalist. But I do think that he has the most positive, inspirational vision for the future of Europe, which is a united continent and a, uh, based on European identity. And, and do you think that means anything if Europe well, continues I mean, on the trajectory Trump. it's going? Yeah, I do think it means something. I, I think a lot of this, I mean, look, as I've said many times, I mean, the Britain is more culturally or racially diverse than the European Union. And all of that immigration that the Brexiteers were complaining about was none of it had anything to do with the European Union. It was all the policy of the nation state. And there was more bureaucracy per capita in Britain than there is in the European Union. So all of those claims, you can make the same claim about Donald Trump. I mean, he is totally in bed with all of these wild figures, the Kushner family being the most obvious. I mean, that, that, that is his son-in-law, even Absolutely. a more direct connection. So, I mean, you know, when we're talking about world leaders who have a chance of actually doing something, if you want to if you want to talk about like a quixotic campaign, you know, like if I ran for president or something, you'd be totally quixotic, quixotic and I would lose. And it, would it be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, who knows? But it would be totally quixotic. I'd get one percent of the vote less. But, you know, in that case, you'd be like, well, Spencer, he's pure. He's just totally in it for his ideology and he wants to spread his message. When you're talking about a figure who's going to get a majority and is going to lead a country, they, they are just by the nature of the beast going to be tainted in some way, you know? And <laughs> yeah. so the question is kind of like, who actually has some juice? Like who has a vision for something beyond that? You guys can disagree with my Macronism, perfectly fine, but you know that is why I have a sincere admiration for Macron. You do expect him to win, then? I do expect him to win. Yes. Um, can okay. I say one one thing about the five percent thing? Because I have been a part of that, um, um, and and uh, and like I have never heard anyone in that group has been. Uh, Hispanic, um, other than the, the, the closest thing is one person who is half uh, Spanish and uh, can pass as Hispanic in some part. But, well, that's uh, more anecdotal, but at, but at least in terms of the pro No, 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 no. I mean, it, I mean, this is not anecdotal because I have been like a, um, a central part of that since it was founded. So, yeah, until recently. So, oh. um, I, I, I mean, if anything, if there's one nationality which there is this proportionately many of its British people so true I can't argue with that and I will say that that more or less answers my qu question with that Richard I had another short one if you have the time um, yeah sure I, I, I came into all of this um, completely uh, politically unaware I was raised uh, messianic Jewish um, you know I interesting very very diametrically opposite upbringing than uh, what I ended up coming into and the person who ended up uh, really converting me um and i didn't have no political awareness you know i was actually uh i kind of like christopher hitchens a little bit sam harris i was kind of into the new atheism thing as okay you know, so hold on messianic jews so you those are P jew they're you have jewish ancestry but who are believers in jesus is that correct well, you have some of those, but you have a lot of butt goys, as you would have them. My dad is Gentile himself, but uh -huh. he – we're Hungarian, but he kind of came into the idea that he had some nominal Jewish ancestry, and he got approached by a shyster uh, rabbi, and, and he got kind of ushered into the whole movement that way, and then ended up uh, becoming a student of Dr. Rabbi Michael Wolf, who kind of runs the whole messianic scene in America, and so okay. yeah, I had a, I had a, a lot lot of uh, a lot of interesting experiences growing up with that and um, I, I kind of rejected it and that's what got me interested in Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, people like that. 
Um, and so that was, you know, the, the breadth of my political awareness at that time. And the person who kind of shook me out of it and brought me along this was really Christopher Cantwell, funny enough. Okay. Um, I was enamored by him. I think he is a very interesting person. Um, I think that uh, he is, his uh, trajectory was just as interesting to watch from libertarianism and, you know, being on the Colbert Report to, uh, you know, mm-hmm. being there side by side with you at Charlottesville. And um, I was wondering if you had anything to say or any thoughts about his performance at the trial. Um, I, it seemed he took a, a kind of different uh, approach to, than some of your co-defendants and, you know, really got aggressive. And myself, of, yeah. And, and yourself and, uh, yeah. and really got aggressive in terms of kind of making it about something slightly more than tr- the trial. And I, I guess I wondered if you had any thoughts about his performance or whether or not it was effective and maybe if he has any – because it seems like he sort of has dis- Distance himself from the larger alt right and TRS, um, as you have. I wonder if you think he has any any future. Yeah, I I, I do. Um, I I genuinely like Chris Cantwell. I mean, he's he's a really flawed. Well, we're getting a lot of feedback. Of I'm going to mute you. Okay. Um. Well, that was someone else. Or right, please mute yourself. Yeah. Um. I think that Cantwell is a flawed person. Um, and you can see a lot of that in Charlottesville, you know, they, the, the Antifa were trying to trigger him and they, and they did. And so, you know, he, he is who he is and you kind of have to take him all in, but he, he is a seriously principled person and he, he's made some mistakes, but, but he, he is serious about this and dedicated to it. And he kind of has taken his lumps and keeps going. Um, I do. He definitely was doing something very different than I was doing and different than some of the other defendants. But um, I do think that he was largely effective. I mean, he he would go after, you know, on cross-examination, he would he would go after a lot of the plaintiffs and being like, you know, oh, so you were in a joyous celebration, were you? Now, now what's this? What's this flag here? What, what's this? Is this a is this a crowbar? Is this a, you know? He was, I, I thought it was, it, it was good. And um, so, you know, um, not what I did, but, you know, but that's okay. Um, so I, yeah, I like Chris. I, I think he's a, I, I, I wish him the best. And um, I do think that he'll keep going once, once he's out of um, prison. I, I do think he'll, um, he'll keep going. <laughs> I do too, and uh, I'm glad to hear that you you have good uh, sentiments for him. I I really believe in Chris, and uh, I believe in you too. And I would uh, I'd love to, I'd love to see the boys get back together. I wish you and Mike would get back in it, but I understand your grievances with TRS or the way things went. And uh, I appreciate you for your time, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, I just don't. There are very few people in the movement who I really want to work with i and um but i i actually have to say i i think cantwell is a he's a real character and um i i would you know i would certainly go and talk with him again um i don't definitely don't want to do a uh, uh public activism <laughs> with him naturally you guys should talk of, uh, with, with pepper spray as he says in his <laughs> boston accent so i uh, don't want to do that but uh yeah he is quite a character I look forward to you guys speaking one day then. Sure. Okay. Um, All right. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Okay. um, I see Horatius is asking, is raising his hand. I'm going to, do you want to jump in on something that's relevant or do you have another question? It's a one, it's a, it's a quick, simple one. How do you feel that the word, the word Gordber is going to be uttered by members of Congress? Unironically. (laughs) They're going to – we had a lot of this at the beginning where, like, Paul Paul Ryan would be like, well, the, these alt-conservatives, uh, we're, we're not sure what to make of them. And uh, the, this PP meme they have, uh, what, what is this thing? You know, there was a, there was a lot of kind of, uh, cr- you know, boomer cringe going on. <laughs> and I, I think it is, it is going to be funny uh, when they do that. Um, what is the, I mean, is the origin of Groyper just, they wanted to, re, to re- revive Pepe, but Pepe is a copyright, you know, um, apparently so the, uh, the tra- they the, went with someone else. The trademark name or the trademark concept is the idea of being cozy. 
And right. you know, yes, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not the one who explain this. For Winters is going to have to explain this in front of Congress. <laughs> yes, I'm going to. I'm personally going to look forward to Justice Breyer learning about Catboy Cami and Nick Winters. I'm looking forward to that moment. Well, <laughs> that, that they should. Def- I mean, if they want to go for the jugular, they would do that and make them answer for Catboy stuff. Do you think that Fuentes is going to be? called before congress or do you think he's going to be deposed privately because a lot of these people like the the j6 committee announced that they had deposed or or spoken with in some form um the ray f sky uh do you think they're gonna give give fuentes the stage i think they might not do that because you know fuentes for all his faults he would definitely take advantage of the situation and you know hilarity would ensue (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who knows who knows um okay uh radar do you want to jump in hi thanks thanks for the floor uh my question is uh essentially an exercise in imagination uh regarding the january 6 uh, rioters or protesters whatever you want to call it like had they because <clears throat> i know that you were like really close to the uh, congressmen and the politicians. What do you think would have happened had they actually managed to sort of breach, like got into contact of the actual politicians, like breach the floor in some way? Do you think they would have killed somebody or made like a much bigger scene or something like that? What well, hypothetic and what would be the fallout of that? Well, it, I know it's an exercise in imagination, but it was a close call, wouldn't you call wouldn't you yeah, say? it? Yeah, it was close. I mean, they were feet away from congressmen at, at some point. I mean, there, there was one scene where like, uh, the, I, I saw surveillance video and like Romney went one way and then two seconds later, these protesters walked in. So I don't know. I mean, it, it, is, it is interesting to imagine because I, I don't want to sound like a shrill liberal and be like, you know, oh, they were just going to machine gun them all or something. But I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they would have, maybe they, you know, if the, the, the QAnon shaman were in there or the guy who put his feet up on the desk and like Nancy Pelosi was there, maybe they would have just lost their shit. Who knows? I mean, I, I don't think it's out of the question. I don't want to be Rachel Maddow, but I also don't think it's out of the question. And even the girl who um, I have to confess I had a mild crush on, um, uh, Riley, my girl Riley. Uh, so she was a Nick Fuentes fan, and she, she was not a fan of mine, sadly. Um, but uh, she did steal a laptop from Nancy Pelosi's office. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's all for the lulls, but like you are absolutely engaging in espionage when you do something like that. And so, <laughs> so I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I think that, that's, I, I think I've said this before and it's, it's worth reiterating. One of the things that's so remarkable about the 21st century is that there, there's this ambiguity about things. So for instance, with, with COVID, you know, you can on some level plausibly say that COVID is just the flu or it's just a cold. Everyone's going to survive. It's not a big deal because for most people, including myself, that is what it is. You know, but the, on the other hand, it's going to end up killing a million people and it's killed millions around the world. It is actually a serious catastrophe. So it's it's not like the Black Death where, you know, four in 10 are dropping dead or something like that. So there's this ambiguity to it all. And I think a very similar thing is taking place with J6, where, you know, if you look at it from one perspective and you see, you know, the QAnon shaman you know, his hijinks, or you see, see the cute old lady in the Capitol, or you see the guy you know, carrying off the podium, you can just laugh at it and be just like, all right, you know, guys, come on, you know, these are trespassing at most. But then you start to look at it from other perspectives, you see really serious, you know, confrontations with the police. Sir, clearly, someone could have died in those confrontations with the police. Um, and people were injured, you see the shooting of Ashley Babbitt, you see all these other things. And you say, wow, this was actually really serious. It's this weird ambiguity to it all. And I, I think that's, that's characteristic of the, of the 21st century. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I could imagine if, if we go through this thought experiment, 
I could imagine Mike Pence acting out the script of the Eastman memo and it working to some degree. I mean, you, you, the idea that you would have, I, I mean, I think what would, what was there is that Republicans, if they were to negate the electors from these swing states, Republicans controlled more like, I'll have to look at him. There was some legal mechanism that it would have worked. Now, what would have happened if it had worked? Let's say that they went in, they terrified the hell out of Congress, and they negated the vote, so all things went through. Donald Trump would be the most illegitimate president of all time. He would, be, he would have terrible approval ratings, but he'd just be kind of hanging on. So I, I think it could have worked. I think if it worked, it would have been a disaster, and it might have been much worse for these people after all. Um, Bartimu, do you want to jump in again or? Yes. Um, when I think of Nick Fuentes, um, I, I'm not a Christian, but I think of this uh, quote from the Bible where it says that, uh, um, he who troubles his own house shall inherit only the wind and the fool mm. shall be servant to the heart of wise. And, uh, I do think you see very much this, uh, that, that, uh, I mean, you, I mean, you said to that he was a bit of a victim and I sort of understand your thinking, but at yeah. the same time, this all comes from his awful personality and, ex- and narcissism, which, uh, um, uh, um, that, 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 that he, that people used him and he was too narcissistic to see the, to see through it, which, uh, I think, uh, I mean, it is obvious to any outsider and, is, and any person who would have had a bad personality or, yeah. um, yeah, to see through it. but Because uh, I don't think there is yeah. any ideological core. I mean, you could argue that exactly. I am just as narcissistic as Fuentes, but the fact is I actually do have an ideological core and I want to achieve something. I think one of the things that I've noticed with Fuentes, and, and in many ways this is a product of his youth, is that you can't really ever pin him down on anything. Like, you can play clips from his show that make him out into a white nationalist and Holocaust denier. But you can also play these clips that make him out as just a mainstream conservative and that he's an ironic white nationalist. And every, everything is like irony upon irony. At the end of the day, that suggests that there's no real there there. You know, what does he actually believe that's different than just being a conservative shill who goes with the flow of conservative ink it's hard to really discover that and so in a way like all there is is narcissism yeah and i do think it's uh, very stupid all the irony things he does because everyone sees through it that uh, yeah uh, oh like uh, like oh if, if if i say this is a joke no one's gonna believe that i that this is a dog whistle that, that i actually believe it but uh, I mean, it's so stupid because everyone says it true. Um, like mainstream conservatives says it true, left-wing groups says it true. Um, so, what is even the purpose of just uh, saying, "Oh, I'm an ironic white nationalist"? The Why purpose is to talk say... to his audience. Like, yeah, basically, but, uh... his audience likes the idea of we're tricking the mainstream, or we are actually mainstream ourselves. So they they like the idea of irony. No one is fooled by it. It's yeah, I mean, it's incredibly no stupid. The audience. Yeah. Um, but at the I, end I of mean, the day, it, it's demoralizing. Oh, I'm sorry. Because, well, it's demoralizing because I, I remember seeing this thing. It, it, was, uh, it was someone who was doing kind of a reaction video to Nick, and they were playing one of his rants. And what he was basically saying was like, um, again, it was this weird way where it's like Nick is this weird boomer or like silent gen character. He was like, First, the women wanted women right, women's rights. So we're like, okay, okay, we'll let you vote. And then you know, we give them an inch, they take a mile. And, and then the blacks wanted this. We're like, all right, all right, we'll, we'll be fair here. And, ah, we give them an inch, they take a mile. He was talking not like a 20-year-old, but like a 75-year-old or something. Someone who, who remembered like segregation or something. It was just bizarre on some level. And then at the end of this rant, he said, Oh, by the way, that was all ironic. It was all a joke. I denounced David Duke and I disavow. I disavow. So it was all this, like, when you do that, you are demoralizing your own side. You know, like, if you actually want to go back to the 1950s, then, then say it. 
And that doesn't mean you can't be funny and tell jokes, but like say it, like you just take your ideas seriously. But if you are constantly disavowing yourself, you're just ultimately demoralizing yourself. And so there's just no there there at the end of the day. So I, I, I do think it's a totally toxic movement, you know, for their own cause. Like they're, 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 they are, they're, they're ultimately demoralizing their own cause, which is the, possibly the worst thing you could possibly do. Yeah, and it's very interesting when you see this phenomenon of young people who are, who, spiritually, they are boomers and they are very old uh, mentally. But at the same yeah. time, they, they, they try to play on this weird uh, in youth culture at the same time. It's a very bizarre phenomenon where, where they have the, uh, where they sound, when they talk politics, they sound like a 75-year-old. But yeah. at the same time, they uh, it's all irony and it's awesome. And they go around with the uh, stupid glasses, uh, sunglass, viper glasses, and uh, it's uh, and the stupid uh, anime frog Elvis. And uh, yeah, I mean it's so insincere and and uh, and, and you never will get anywhere with this. You, I mean, because it's it's so stupid yeah. the whole thing. All right, Elliot, Elliot Smith, Elliot Smith, fifty. You have before. Elliot. Unmute your mic. Going once. Going twice. Sold. All right. Andrew. Andrew the Younger. You hey, what's up? Um, hey. I am curious to know. This is a related question. I'm curious to know what to get your opinion on the future of activism. Because I don't, I mean... January 6th was a kind of activism, but uh, idiocy first and foremost. But um, so how I see it today, it seems to be like this spontaneity, like you see Patriot Front and NJP in uh, Wisconsin after the Mm -hmm. Kenosha thing. So I I mean, my personal opinion is like, yeah, that I don't know what else like they how else you you can't tell people. like, hey, we're, we're going to do this event in this park and, you know, everybody's going to, I mean, you're just going to get railroaded. Um, but uh, I'm curious to know uh, your thoughts. Well, I don't have any plans to engage in activism in the foreseeable future. Um, I'm not opposed to it per se, um, but I, I don't think it's, it's not how I'm going to, invest my limited resources and energy. And I, I do think, I mean, Patriot Front, you know, they, 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 they actually had some successes to a degree. I mean, they, you know, they were not fatsos like the conservatives, which drove the conservatives crazy. They, they were organized and, and they did it. But I, I think there's this like vague quality to Patriot Front where it's like, reclaim America and, you know, blah, 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 where it just seems like performance art at some point, you know, it's like, we're, we're acting as if we were a movement or something. It, it's just there. What is the point of it? I think is a really big question to ask and going out there and claiming we're going to reclaim America, but we're not going to show our face. I'm sorry. that That's just never going to work. And like there's a reason why people distrust that and call them feds. So, I mean, I'm not totally opposed to Patriot Front. I'm not, I'm not trying to jump on their back or anything, but it, it just does seem to be like this. This isn't how we should be using our resources. Um, that that's my very strong impression about them. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't see a lot of point to it, and so it's just not how I'm going to use my my time. I've kind of figured as much. I did think that their um, life, liberty, and victory, I think, was their slide. I thought that was, like, I was uh, kind of taken aback by it. It's kind well, of interesting. what does it mean? Right, <laughs> you know, right. I mean, I, I, you know, I guess I could be accused of putting forth, you know, provocative, though ambiguous slogans, like, become who we are. But, uh, you know, they're marching, they're, car- they're waving the flag, and they're saying things like, you know, again, you have life, liberty and victory or, you know, wh- what does it really mean? Like, wh- what are you what are they against? What are they for? What are they doing? And who are they? 
Those are, those are real questions that people are going to ask. And I don't know if they could really answer them. They don't talk to the media at all. So it's kind of like the, the opposite of my strategy, which was always talk to the legacy institutions <laughs> because I, I always have an elite theory of everything and top down theory of everything. They have the, they have the opposite theory, but like, now no one really knows what you're about or what you're doing. And you also, due to the mask wearing, which is, doesn't have anything to do with COVID, I mean, you, you're basically kind of declaring that you are dissidents or you, you can't show your face. I, I just, I don't think it ultimately works. And again, I'm not trying to bash them or anything like that. What I'm saying is actually constructive criticism, but it, it just doesn't really make sense in in my mind and it's just not something i really want to go do and i don't think they want me to do it i mean they don't want to have a spencer rally as well that's very clear they don't they definitely don't want that and so i guess it's kind of a mutual agreement that we're not gonna really be in contact um so you know there it is um okay wvg you have the floor WVG. Oh, sorry, I didn't let you in. There you go. WVG. Hello, I just have um, a question for the audience. Uh, I would just like to ask them why they aren't watching America First with Nick J. Fuentes on Cozy TV and listening to Ultra Shield in their off time. Shout out Hank Chill. Uh, JD just got back on the app. Brother, he's in the audience. Um, okay. You got your plug in. Um, uh, all right. Let me see here. Brendan, do you want to talk? Brendan? Unmute, Brendan. Okay. Um, Adolf der Deutsche Amerikaner, you have the floor. Hello. Okay, um, I'm going to go to Polly. Um, you have the floor. Polly Calhoun. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, sure. So back to conservatives being in denial of reality and January 6th, um, what do you think about this whole letter from the uh, what is it, Conservative Action Project about booting um, Kinzinger and Cheney off for the uh, January 6th committee? Um, so uh, I haven't exactly heard about that. I mean, I it doesn't surprise me. So what is the conservative action project? I'm not sure. A lot of people signed on to it. Like a lot of, um, a lot of pretty well-known people, um, like Gary Bowers, um, Justice Tom, uh -huh. wife, of course, of course. Oh, Jenny Thomas. She might get subpoenaed. Any day now. <laughs> I know. I was thinking, um, shouldn't, shouldn't he be kind of recused from anything on the sixth now? <laughs> he might have to be. Um, I look, I, I, there's definitely a battle going on for the soul of the conservative movement. And the Trump people, much like the religious right in the 80s, where they, they kind of took over a lot of the infrastructure, they made all Republicans go pro life. Um, I, I think there's a similar thing going on um against liz cheney and kinziger and some of these people even dan crenshaw to a degree although dan crenshaw has kind of played to that crowd also but yeah i mean they are they are battling it out um and i i think that's what this is about it's it's kind of interesting because there there's a tendency of these people to even go against trump you know there there was when trump made his statements about the vaccine in december and, and he's continued to make the statements i mean there's that that energy can sometimes get out of his control even. Um, but I was I was shocked. I mean, I I didn't think that Trump could have survived J6. And the fact that 
you know, he got the Republicans to kick Liz Cheney off these committees. The fact that he got like some of these, you know, kind of dumb as rocks, you know, blow, go with the, go whichever way the wind is blowing um, guys like um, McCarthy um, to basically on the one hand denounce J six, like in the days afterward, and then go after Liz Cheney, you know, three months later, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And um, so, you know, it is what it is. They're battling for who controls the GOP and who the GOP is going to really pander towards. And I think they will win ultimately. I mean, I think the days of the GOP kind of talk being kind of a middle to upper middle class waspy party are over. And, you know, there's just these little things that you can see. I mean, there's something I saw on Twitter that people were talking about um, where Republicans are actually pretty okay with um, like ch children out of wedlock. And, you know, and if you look back, if you think about Republicans, how they would answer a Pew survey or whatever 20 years ago, it's, it's just kind of unimaginable. There is even something I saw where um, the, there was a GOP, like it was a 4th of July meme that they put out and they had this woman who kind of appeared to be a single mom in a way, like her, her husband was not there. She had, she was holding a, um, an automatic rifle of some kind and she was there with her kid. And then she had like real visible tattoos. And again, it was just one image. Don't make too much about it, but like the fact that they're catering to that demographic is a huge change. You know, I mean, even with Romney, the GOP was still the blazers and khakis. You know, you're a Presbyterian or Episcopalian, you're buttoned up, you've got a job and so on. And those whites are increasingly going to the Democratic Party. And so the, the GOP really is being fundamentally changed. So I think the Trumpians will win this well, battle. Definitely. Um for better and for worse. <laughs> but with the whole, with the January 6th thing, I mean, it seems like the closer they get to, you know, prosecuting higher ups, that seems to trigger more and more, um, you know, once respectable conservatives um, to voice their opposition to the January 6th investigation. Um, yeah. I mean, oh, I, I'm not they don't that, like it, but that's yeah. odd, you know. Well, they, and they also created their own, like, they created their own witch hunt in a way because they, the, they, they refused to be involved with it. And so what ultimately happened is that it became a kind of partisan witch hunt mm -hmm. because they rejected the whole idea of it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, we're, again, we're just in, yeah, we're just in an age of extremely shrill uh, polarization. Um, but anyway, thanks for your questions and comments. Yeah, um, yeah sure. Brendan, do you, you wanted to jump in real quick? Uh, yeah, hi again. Um, I was wondering, my question was, do you believe that this deplatforming and jailing and the ultimate demise of the edgy grift right is kind of necessary for politics to move forward in this country? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like them. And um, I think there probably was a time where I thought that the alt light was a good thing. And because they were trying, they were looking towards us um, back in the alt right days, but I don't think that anymore. And I don't really shed a tear over their demise. And I, I do think that there, there is just something fundamentally toxic about all of them that they, you know, they, they latched onto the alt-right as a online energy source, but they never actually cared about, you know, say me personally or my ideas or the, the, the real ideas of the alt-right. I mean, they never really cared about that. They just simply saw it as an energy source that they could tap into. And they will get rid of it as soon as it no longer becomes useful. And they'll tap into something else like QAnon. And so I, I don't think that it is a positive thing. 
And I do think that there just, there has to be, I mean, at the end of the day, there, there does need to be some kind of like institutional standard in terms of what is considered news. And, you know, if a nation is going to continue and survive, there has to be some kind of institutional standard like that. And additionally, like the alt light people, they're, they're just, they're just really shitty people at the end of the day. Just, just really awful. Like Posobiec, Jim Hoff, you know, just down the line. They're just awful. It's awful nonsense. And I, yeah, I absolutely don't shed a tear for them. And I don't want to be associated with them. And I, I don't want to be taken down with them. <sighs> okay. Uh, George, Georgist Frog. Hi, Richard. Um, okay. I, was, I was wondering, uh, do you think if Trump would have actually taken back the presidency during January 6th, do you think he would prosecute everybody just as viciously? just because he would try to uh, gather legitimacy and then he would, I don't know, his grifters would just sort of try to gaslight everybody that there's no connection between the Trump power grab and January 6th because he has a track <laughs> record of just throwing everybody under the bus. <laughs> that would be a little much, but yeah, I, could, I wouldn't put that past him. <laughs> I mean, that would be just totally insane. To jail his own supporters who put him into power. <laughs> huh? Yeah, stranger things have happened. Ooh, Ooh, look. I was wondering. Oh, go ahead. Do you, yeah. Sorry, uh, I was wondering wh why do you think Biden lost uh, the independence so fast? I mean, there were the very white liberals who wanted normalcy after Trump. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I, I think that the. The, the dynamic that created Trump is still in play. And for instance, I mean, this is not a bold prediction at all. I mean, I, I, am, I think that the GOP will probably take back the House in fall. Um, I, I, that, that Trump dynamic is actually still in play. And I, you know, Don, Biden was an attempt at back to normalcy. But it almost can't be like that, that there is there is both the left that's going to trigger the hell out of people that still exists, that still is a kind of energy source for the Democratic Party. And then there's also right wing grifters who are going to kind of inflame that and profit from it. So like you see, like all the CRT stuff going on. Right. Um, I think it's also hard for Biden to win in, in COVID. I, there's just it creates a lot of negative social mood. And, you know, I think Biden is kind of overwhelmed by COVID. I mean, COVID is mutating at these crazy levels. Um, I don't think it's wrong to say that everyone's going to get COVID uh, sooner or later. And um, I, I think it just kind of got it's out of his hands. He can't. He clearly is overmatched. He does not want to lock down the 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 country again and he's going you know it's not fair but he's definitely going to be blamed for this because there is also an assumption that like once we get a sane person in office then it'll just go away you know and um so he's he's in a he's in a difficult spot one of my favorite uh, cartoons i've seen recently was of uh um, it, it, it is of a fat conservative who, uh, who yells at Biden and he says, uh, um, uh, no, I will never wear the mask. No, I will never get vaccinated. And why haven't you end the pandemic? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's, they, they do that. They do. I mean, that's, that's like a direct quote on some level. Um, Okay. Oh, wow. Salt is back. After insulting me personally, he's back trying to speak again. Salt, you have the floor. Yeah, I apologize. I got a, got a little heated at the end there yesterday. Oh, so did I. It's okay. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to ask, uh, so the one thing we haven't seen in the January 6th uh, investigation so far is clear evidence of foreign involvement. Is that mm. the 
Is that just the incompetence of foreign spy agencies, or or have we yet just yet to discover it? Because the you know there's always that hint of Trumpism, uh, the seventy five thousand dollars spent on Facebook ads or whatever. Yeah. But I would think if you really wanted to destabilize the United States, you'd be a part of that. Or do you think that's where the five hundred thousand dollars in anonymous French Bitcoin donations come in? All good questions. And the, the, the short answer is I don't know. But I do, th- I mean, and I, I was talking about this a little bit this morning when I, I've done a lot of spacing today. Um, my take on Russian involvement is, is fairly nuanced. I don't, I, I am not, I don't think that Donald Trump is a Manchurian candidate. I don't think that Putin is pulling the strings on foreign policy decisions. And if anything, Putin has actually benefited from Biden's presidency. So like the North Stream issue, Biden is being much more diplomatic than Trump was. And I think also to a degree, Trump was trying to like show off that he's not in Putin's pocket by, you know, doing these sanctions and so on about, you know, gas to Central and Western Europe. Um, but my, my sense is that the, there is a Russian agenda to basically stir up the shit and throw spaghetti up against the wall and see what sticks. And that they will promote stuff that is just awful and toxic and nonsensical is a kind of middle finger to the U.S. And so I, do, I, I would not be surprised if on some level – Russia, or the, you know, there was some kind of internet research agency or whatever that is promoting QAnon nonsense. And QAnon led directly to J6. But, and, and Russia has kind of promoted J6. You have these statements by Putin where he's like, well, we, we're monitoring the situation of J6 prisoners in the United States. It's a threat to democracy. You know, this kind of trollish type comments like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my my vision of Russian interference is basically, you know, promoting all of this nonsense and perhaps having connections with some of these actors, um, someone like Posobiec or whatever. Um, I, again, I don't have direct evidence for this, so everything I say needs to be taken with a grain of salt. But that's my vision of what the Kremlin is up to. And I don't think it's good. Um, I think we all kind of like made fun of the Russia conspiracy when Trump in 2016 and 2017, because we felt like we were winning. But now that I'm kind of seeing the whole thing, I I do think that there is evidence for this. Charles Bousman, interesting figure. He clearly highly Russian sympathetic. Um, He created this Russian insider, which reposted a lot of my stuff, I would say over the years Um, he either is some kind of agent or wants to be an agent. And he was absolutely inside the Capitol and he has fled the country after January 6th. So there, you know, there, there is actually some there there. Now, again, it isn't a coup like the United States installing Pinochet or like supporting an armed, you know, insurrection or coup of that kind. But are, are there foreign actors who are kind of promoting this nonsense? Yes. All right. Um, okay. Let me get some more people. I've been going for a while. Um, let me see if I missed someone here. Okay, Jeff Reich. Jeff Reich going once, going twice, sold. Okay, daytime something, daytime drinker. Oh, Jeff Reich, there you are. Okay, you've got the floor. And now there you go. Okay, daytime drink. Oh, there you're back again. Okay, Jeff, speak. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what do you think about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? As a vehicle uh, for white nationals in America. I don't think that is a good vehicle. I mean, I, it's definitely a kind of fertility cult. And um, 
it uh, obviously uh, on some level promotes, you know, good behavior and, and so on. But um, I, I don't think that there's going to be any proxy for a cause like that. We, we can't just go to something that is objectively and, and vocally against what we want and think that we're going to gain something from it. Um, so I don't have anything against Mormons. In fact, almost every Mormon and almost every ex-Mormon I've ever met has been a nice person. But um, I, I, I absolutely reject the notion of pursuing white interests through the LDS church. One more question. Okay. Uh, what do you think about the new governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin? Uh, you know, I don't have big problems with him. He seems to be kind of riding a, a Trump wave of some kind, riding a CRT wave. Um, he'll probably, you know, he's, he, he's linked up with uh, the industrial, military industrial complex. I mean, he's probably going to let all these people down and they're going to be disappointed. But I don't, don't, don't really have any problem with Youngkin. Um, okay, daytime drinker. Um, thanks for giving me the floor here. Um, sure. I have kind of an open-ended question. Um, first off, as like, are you familiar with the term like a parasocial relationship? Yes. So, uh, could you could you just explain that though? What you mean by that, like, it's like almost like you're in love with an Instagram model, or you you feel like you're friends with someone who's on YouTube. Is that what you were talking yeah. about? Well, I would describe it as like a sort of like psychological relationship between like a consumer of media and a producer of media, you know? Right. And um, the kind of, I have an open-ended question here. Um, and I joined a little bit late. So maybe I didn't hear a whole lot of um, what you had to say about like the sort of really cynical like actors within the alt light or whatever. Yeah. But um, I you know I have this sort of like relatively underdeveloped theory within my mind, which goes something along the lines of you know, um, let me see. I wrote this down here. Well, the idea that I have is that, um, for example, like in 2015, for example, um, I remember seeing like the ad revenue model of um, any kind of publishing collapse. You know, I remember, um, you know, all these kinds of zines um, go from you know, freely go from being freely available online to um, requiring subscriptions from their members, you know? Yeah. And um, I feel like this kind of, it's indicative of a, it's indicative of a trend where um, media kind of, require subscriptions from their followers, you know? And I know, um, for example, I know you follow, for example, people like Tim Pool and Hassan Abi, for example, on YouTube. Yeah. And um, just to get to my point, just to keep this short, I feel like in order to, I feel like, Politics online has become, um, it's become entirely built on trust, you know, through parasocial relationships. Yeah. Or like Substack, where, you know, you subscribe to Glenn Greenwald and, you know, he's making bank this way. And what you get from him is basically complaining about liberals, you know. And you get yeah. that, you get this kind of like reinforcement every day. Oh, look how the liberals are still hypocrites and still bastards and still unfair and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just this kind of endless churn 
of you know a take that's not actual analysis or reporting and yes I, I i absolutely think this is a huge thing and it, and it is very parasitic in the way that like i don't follow hassan as as much but i i know a little bit more about tim pool but it's all totally parasitic like it they're literally doing reaction videos you know it's like you see those reaction yeah. videos when a trailer comes out where someone will be like, oh, I haven't watched the new Star Wars trailer. Let me watch it right now. And they're like, they're making <laughs> facial expressions. But in some ways, that's like what they are doing. They're they're reacting to things and giving you their take on the fly. But it's all like highly derivative. They're not really creating anything new. And Hassan might claim that he's a socialist or whatever, but he's not adding to discourse all that much and he's certainly not like motivating people to do activism it's just kind of like yeah we hate yeah liberals suck and conservatives are kind of worse and you know like let me let me react to tim pool's reaction to jimmy Dore's rant against sam cedar's tweet or whatever you know and it just it's just this <laughs> it's this like dive you know get navel gazing upon navel gazing it's just nonsense you know and nothing is really being added to discourse and instead we're just kind of engaging in reaction videos and it's yeah i mean it's terrible i try not to consume it and i definitely try not to reward anyone with payments but it, it does have a lot of similarities to like only fans and instagram and so on like pay me for like I, you're, I'm, I'm going to be your, you know, digital girlfriend in a weird way. You know, you're going to pay me money. Like you have to buy your girlfriend drinks and dinner and I'm going to tell you that I love you and I'm going to show you my tits and, you know, it's a weird, horrible, toxic thing that is, is endemic at this point. But, um, you know, thanks for like picking up on my terrible like preface to this question but um like it feels to me like this is pretty much how the media has developed in the 21st century you know yeah like Absolutely. i don't think this is how it was in like the early 20th century you know it definitely wasn't and it's definitely it's not just partisanship like someone um, an hour ago or something was mentioning that, you know, back in the day, you would have these highly partisan, extremely polemical newspapers, you know, in every city, multiple ones. And, you know, it, it's not quite like that. I think it's something very different. I, I think it might be called like only fans media is maybe the best way or parasocial is, is also a good way of describing it. But it's, it's very toxic and yeah. um, it's just best stayed away from. All right. Um, All right. Thanks for yeah. taking me. Yeah, sure. You make some good points. Okay, Errol, uh, Errol the Egyptian. Can I say you... something which uh, ties yeah. into this? Sure. Um, Go for it. Um, because I think it's very interesting that, uh, especially the right, they don't have any. Um, uh, any own journalist or whatever they just uh, react to whatever uh, leftists do and i think that's a huge waste of resources to just write this uh, to run a old news site and just react to what the new york times is uh, is uh, writing is put uh, angry headlines or uh, angry reacting videos i mean it's such a waste of uh, resources when you could just go out uh, um, like just you get a journalist uh, degree and go out and do your own uh, uh, and create your own news and your own narrative, and don't uh, rely on these uh, um, uh, on these left wing websites. But it's apparently it is apparently possible to write for um, these uh, right wing people to actually do that. It's just about reacting, 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 reacting. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's such so. Um, I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless that uh, they lack such that they lack such uh, creativity and. Uh, and uh, they are so boring, these people. Well, also, they're obsessed with news. You know, I, I think there's also a, a kind of new type of person who's the news junkie. And, you know, they do, I, I saw a lot of these 
you know, pretty fascinating stories on like Vice or whatever about in the fake news era. These people who would run a Facebook page, they would have millions of subscribers and they were what, what, what I guess could be called um, scraping news. So they would take news from other sources and kind of put their spin on it and then post it on Facebook. And they were getting huge amounts of traction this way there there is this new type of human that is, that's very that's often conservative that is just endlessly refreshing the dredge report endlessly checking out gateway pundit in you know w- w- listening to the breitbart podcast or whatever like it, it's a it's a totally new thing that is you know again like very strange i i think mark Brahman is pointing this out where you know, liberals are more likely to watch like streaming series, like fictional series that they like. And so they're, they're kind of into narrative and like setting the agenda and morality and twist and so on. And conservatives are obsessed with news, watching Fox, you know, and uh, own and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very different. And I, and I think it's actually, in this way, kind of better to be watching fiction. Um, because... Yes, uh, <laughs> and uh, it ties into the thing about uh, that stupid slogan about facts don't care about your feelings, but uh, um, be, be, because they don't really understand that you have to have a narrative structure and you have to be a more of a, uh, idealist to change yeah. the world. You cannot only go on cold facts and uh, some gossip about uh, some politicians who uh, had an affair or something. Or, or or something I've seen recently about they complaining that Fauci has uh, has a big wage, uh, um, earns a lot of money, and it's uh, I mean who cares? I mean if if a bureaucrat earns a lot of money who has such a high position, it, like not nothing of that is going to change the world. And uh, yeah, it's also stupid. I mean they 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 should do like liberals do and just. Uh, um, keep uh, watching Harry Potter every month and uh, start uh, <laughs> quoting about uh, oh oh this situation this reminds me of Hermione and uh, <laughs> and uh, yes Fauci is the Death Eaters or whatever that would be much more interesting um, yeah <laughs> definitely uh, okay so um, Adolf der Deutsche Amerikaner um, would you like to say something then I'm going to call it quits we've been doing this for two hours Richard, can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah, sure. Oh, who, who's, who said that? This is Errol. Okay, yeah, Errol. Uh, j- jump in, and then I'll go to Adolf, and then I'll call it quits. Can I get you to pontificate real quick what you think the future of the Republic is going to be? Maybe next half century? Um, I, I think we are deep into a large-scale imperial decline that is going to resemble the decline of the Roman Empire, and it will involve the birth of strange, new, redemptive, and messianic creeds that are going to be cropping up. There you go. Uh, Yeah, I mean, that's... I I, I have the same kind of feeling. Uh... (laughs) I, it's very hard not to compare this stage of America to uh, uh, to the late stages of the Roman Republic. Right? Yeah, I don't okay. think it's. I don't think we're going to see like an actual secession movement or civil war. I think there yeah. there might be a disintegration like down the line, but mm-hmm. I I do think that we are like really deep into a declining empire, and I and I don't think we fully recognize that. Sure. Can and, you elaborate? Can you elaborate? a little bit and what you mean by creeds uh, yeah uh, i mean i i think uh wokeism is a kind of new religion it's an it's a it's an ever-changing kind of ever-developing one but it is a new religion and i think even something like QAnon is a glimpse of into what a, a kind of right-wing version of that would be uh i think people are going to grasp desperately grasp at a replacement for christianity yeah. And uh, on the political side, it seems to me that uh, 
I, 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 the, the the lack of trust in, in the voting process gets a lot of attention on the conservative side, especially, you know, with recent news and such. But uh, Joe Biden came out and said today that, you know, if this voting rights bill doesn't pass, the, the election might not be legitimate. I mean, the, the seeds are definitely there for for the, you know, the collapse of trust in all sorts of democratic institutions. So I think the, yeah. the time where we go into like a, an official, I don't know if it's going to look like an all or whatever, uh, but democracy in, in America is very, very much reaching its end, is my view, at least. Yeah. All right. Um, is, there, uh, is it okay if I add one more thing? Uh, I thought I was going to go. Well, yeah, oh. let's let Odd up add. He hasn't spoken yet. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I apologize, but I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so... I remember, uh, first of all, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but I remember, I think you were, you did like some speech or some thing at a college a while ago. I think it was some college in the South. I can't remember what it was, but you said something like your goal was to create a white, a white identity, something, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is excellent because um, I don't see very many people doing that explicitly or smartly. Um, and I think that's absolutely necessary. And I think the work that you and uh, Mark Brahman have been doing on that is um, invaluable. But thank you. Of course. Uh, but I have wondered um, how that would obviously to do it in the United States and Europe, I think would be two different tasks, um, you know, given the politics, but I don't know how that, how you intend to do that in the United States, because it just seems like whites are so divided along, you know, history and ethnic lines. Uh, I, I remember reading something a while back about how, even today, uh, you still don't have white people sort of vote as similarly as you would think. You have, you know, uh, Irish people, you know, um, uh, Eastern European immigrants, you know, those kind of people more voting democratic and um, along different issues. Um, and then you have the old stock Republicans, you know, Scots, um, English people voting more to the Republican side. And they seem to be content to use these new immigrants to just sort of, um, you know, non-white immigrants. They seem to be content to use those people to try and further their, their own um, smaller goals, regardless of how it detriments, you know, a larger white identity. So what I'm wondering is what do you, what in your mind would be necessary to create something that whites could say, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with getting on board with this. Um, I, I, I I'm going to punt on answering this. This is just so open-ended. Um, in terms of like creating white identity. And I, I would just say that what I am focusing on now is spirituality. And it's not just about getting people to vote in unison or something like that. I think that was achieved to a large degree by the GOP and we saw how much that was worth. Uh, I, I'm just mostly focused on, on spiritual critique at this point. Sorry to kind of punt, but not at all. I question understand. was a bit big and, little bit vague so um i yeah. i don't want to go on for another hour <laughs> no worries I appreciate would you ever run for office uh i think it would be really fun to do that i don't think it's really in the cards right now i mean i've said this before i i i think that it would it would be good for there to be a kind of quixotic campaign similar to the ron paul campaign that would be about bringing you know a message out there and so on 
but I, I just I'm not sure it's in the cards. And, and keep in mind, because I am my own guy, and I'm I, I challenge. I like to challenge people. I like the challenge. You know, I I have you know I'm I'm pretty much hated to a large degree among most of the alt right. I mean, there there is a lot. I don't think it would be about like bringing on the alt right. I think it would have to be through some other way. But I think if I ever did something like that, I would do it in a quixotic manner. Like I wouldn't just run for like mayor of Kalispell or something. I don't think I would win that anyway. But uh, I don't even know what I would do if I won. But no, I would I would do something like running for president. I think there there could still be something positive that could be gained from a quixotic campaign that's about getting a bold message, very similar to what Ron, Ron Paul did. And um, I, I would be for that. But again, there's no infrastructure for that. I mean, for that, you need a team of lawyers. You need consistent donors. You, you, you need all this stuff. The the alt right or the dissident right as it is 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 massively fragmented, and you know I I just I don't think it would kind of work in the current you know situation that it is, and so I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to focus. I have limited resources, and I'm going to focus that on stuff that that's really important to me. But I don't think it's a bad idea. Maybe someone else could do it, but um, I think I would be the best. <laughs> It would be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, I don't think it's in the cards right now. I don't know. I, I think it maybe the window closed on that. I mean, you you, you can be yeah. ambitious and, and so on, but you also have to be realistic. And I, I'm not sure it's really in the cards right now. I, I don't see it as something. I think it would just be viewed as kind of, I, I think it would it would be viewed contemptuously if I did that right now. And I, I so I'm not going to do it. But maybe there could be a time where it could be done in a really cool way. But I don't see it happening right now. But I certainly am not against it or something like that. You know, like, oh, I'm a simple man. You know, I, I don't I don't want power. That's terrible. I would never even think about being. No, of course, I think about all that stuff. I crave power. But, you know, you also have to be realistic. Okay, Brendan, you wanted to say something real quick, and then we'll call it a night. Yeah, real quick. I shared a tweet from CNBC saying that America now has 22 million millionaires. On Wikipedia, China has 5 million. Uh, Japan has 3 million. Germany has 2 million. So it's not like rich people can't fix any problems. It's just That's in U.S. dollars, though. They, they choose to give their money to the dumbest grifters on the left yeah. and the right to control the spectrum and to prevent an intellectual uprising. And so all of this stuff that you see, all the stupidity that you see is really created by the elites. Um, Occupy Wall Street was absorbed by wokeism because wokeism was invented by corporate America. And then on the right, uh, the grift, the grifters were set up as a way to collect money and steal the audience of, yeah. for the benefit of the Republicans. And now it's getting out of control, but it was all to prevent an intellectual uprising against liberalism. Yes. I mean, 22 million. That's interesting. I, I think they're around the world. They're like a million billionaires or something. And we can't find 2000 billionaires to. Yeah. And we can't find someone to. Or how many did you say? 2000 billionaires and half of them. 2, are in the billion. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, but well, okay. you're talking in terms of US... that was my, very different than what I said. Um, Maybe someone told me a million millionaires at one point. Now they're 22 million. There is a now keep in mind, if you have a million dollars, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you're like part of the elite. I mean, that that could be tied up in some assets and and so yeah, those on. Those 22 million are just in our country. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, your point still stands, which is that if we wanted to have these institutions, we could have them. But we there is just a seemingly a kind of conscious effort to just promote all of this nonsense. It's very sad. It's astroturfed by the elites. It'll backfire on them, but they'd rather fund the dumbest grifters and just take their money, take their audience and keep hold on to power that way. Yeah. Instead of be threatened by institutions. Yeah. There's no real institution. There's no, there, there hasn't been the establishment of something that people really look to 
that they respect and they want to work at and that's that's producing all this stuff it's it's a bunch of you know including stuff that i do which is re- you know a lot of me i'm gonna go do this tonight i'm gonna go work on um mark's book um you know it's it's a lot of me doing work on stuff and and kind of what's the right word you know um bootstrapping it and there there isn't i don't have a team of people underneath me that i can hand off stuff to and these people don't want to create that they you know how many millions of dollars do you have to throw at some of this just tim pool type stuff or just stupid crap you know like that you see in the alt right of you know let's let's you know rewrite a breitbart article or you know uh, talk about some black crime incident for the millionth time you know how many times do you want to just pay a blogger to do that crap um and not put that towards something that's actually going somewhere i mean it's just very it's just awfully depressing i've never heard of a country with the most rich people in history where literally every single one 100.000 percent all want to go in the same direction and just want everything to collapse and they're okay with it. I've never, I don't understand that part about humans mm-hmm. or this country. It's, I don't even think there's a historical example for how ridiculous uh, the rich are. They just kind of, they're more homogenized than the 98% of blacks who vote Democrat. This is like 100% rich people just wanting to go take everything down with them. It's beyond me. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, Let's call it quits. All right. I'm glad these are being recorded because these are very good conversations. And um, thank you all for participating and thank you all for listening. And I will talk to you guys soon. All right. Ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs>